it's grown crazy and we've grown pretty damn yeah, crazy too. Yeah. No, yeah. I see I see your story the amount of people that share on your stories is, is crazy. But yeah. what's that what's that term? Phone eat phone eats first? Phone eats first, I think. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. So now we have phone <laughs> phone preps first. Yeah, there you phone go. <laughs> preps first. Welcome back to Texas Tea. I'm Roger Dupre with Eastwood Energy Group, and today I'm here with Dallas's star in the meal prep business, Kyle Clark, co-founder, CEO, CEO of Dallas Prep Kitchen. How are Thanks. you, brother? Good to meet you. Good to meet you, too. Thank you for having me in your uh, now kitchen. You have a new one coming yeah. soon, right? Yeah, we're building a new kitchen up in Addison. We're pretty excited about okay. that. Yeah. So. We've kind of outgrown this one. I know. That. You're telling me yeah. how it gets a little stuffy in a little here. A little tight when you've got about 20 employees in this yeah, little kitchen. Yeah, yeah. So, But this is where this is where the magic comes from. So before I roll into it, first, I'm trying to deal with something a little bit different. Sure. Uh, quick question for someone listening that is maybe an aspiring entrepreneur in the food industry or prep food industry. What's one, the biggest piece of advice you give them for when they start, like, hey, this is what you got to do, like, key, keystone part of how you're going to be successful. Um, probably right off the bat, I would just say, you know, learn the industry, get yourself a mentor. Um, you know, I didn't have one at first, and you know, you don't really think about things in the business like food costs or margins. Um, you know, that's a pretty big part of it, right? right. And, and uh, you know, really just hustling and making sure that you're doing everything you can with customer service and quality of product and, and putting all that up front before, you know, your success, because right. that'll come later, you know, where you got to have a foundation set right. with, uh, with your food and your customer service and all that. So, so I heard a few things there. I heard mentor. Yeah, sure. I, I heard you said, make sure that your margins are correct. Oh yeah. Very and, important. And also and hustle to make sure you have that foundation of customer care. Uh, going to the margins thing, uh, that's, uh, I don't know a whole lot of, in, in, of the restaurant industry myself, but I do understand they're very thin. Uh, what were some of the things you kind of ran into where you're like, holy crap, we're getting to the point where we're not going to make any profit, or were there th things you found that you're able to expand on to make more profit or make your company sure. more profitable? I mean, um, some of the first stuff was when you, when you don't have the volume, this is purely a volume play, right? Mm -hmm. Where you, you want to feed the whole entire city of Dallas and yeah. not just a few people because right, right, right. you have to fill the an infrastructure. You have to have the cooks, the drivers, the locations, the, the rent on the kitchen. You have to right. have all that stuff set. And until you have a certain amount of orders coming in, you're definitely not making money, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So people think it's... It's glorious, but at the end of the day, you have to build your business and, and get to that volume before you start making money. And, and food margins are so slim already, you know, so, uh, you know, just learning those and, and shopping food. I, I, we went a whole year with only getting our food from one vendor, and then we brought in our executive chef now. Yeah. And now we have about five vendors that we shop our food with, you know, and we know who's the best produce and the best proteins and seafoods and things like that. And, and then when you have a volume, right, now you have negotiation with them. Mm. And I can say, hey, I'm doing, you know, a thousand pounds of chicken a week. You know, I need to, I need it cheaper. You yeah, know, yeah, so yeah. those are some things that, you know, take time to build as well. But, yeah. yeah. So at the very beginning, it's just getting those orders going. Oh, yeah. Get the original logistics. Yeah, you got, you got to hustle to get, get the volume up, yeah, you yeah. know, and you got to. You got to sell it cheaper, maybe, to, and attract more people to try it out. Right. I, we feel like once you try our food, you know it's the best out there, and, right. it, and it continues to keep you. So, you know, doing events and things where we can hand you a sample of our food, that got a lot of people coming to us because there's so many other meal prep services out there that people yeah. have tried and they weren't happy with, and they look at us as just another meal prep service. So. Yeah. To give them some food to actually try, yeah, that yeah, was yeah. a huge return on investment for us. I got Absolutely. you. I got you. Uh, and I was gonna, I was gonna roll back because you said you had hired a chef, Wolfgang Puck. Yeah, he came from, came from Wolfgang, Wolfgang Puck, Puck, and he's been with Morton's for over ten years. Oh, so, right. okay. So he's definitely a, a gourmet steakhouse kind of uh, right. 
kind of mentality and Definitely recipes taste it, and taste things. It. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Um, you you got to set yourself apart somewhere. Right, right, so, right yeah. of course. Uh, so before that, though, I think you had mentioned to me uh, you and your partner were starting out cooking yourself late nights. Yeah. Um, how did that? How did that go? Because I think you said you came from a financial background. Yeah, yeah. So how, how did you? Get into culinary all of a sudden. Um, started real young when I was 15. I cooked a pizza up for about a, about a month. <laughs> nice. Not, not, <laughs> okay. So that's all. I, that's the only experience I had. But so I was in the finance industry uh, for about eight years. Um, I started doing some bodybuilding and really worried focusing on that. And yeah. obviously, in that you start eating a lot and yeah, yeah. you're watching your diet and you're eating more than the normal person type of thing. And right. uh, I hated cooking and I hated the time it took and the cleanup and all that, you know, just the normal meal prep deal. Right. right, right so right. I'd go to a restaurant and I'd have them cook me like eight pounds of chicken and eight pounds of steak <laughs> yeah. like twice a week. And I would go pick it up. I'd take it home and I'd portion it out. Right. Yeah, so yeah. It's like, man, why isn't anybody doing this? And mm -hmm. and so that's kind of where it started. But but to get this really going, we knew we couldn't afford a chef right off the bat. And right. I, I, I can cook, right? I can grill some ch steak and chicken, yeah, right? And yeah. so anyways, me and my, my partner, Nick Corso, uh, we, uh, it was me and him, man. We, we would grind it out in the kitchen. We'd yeah. spend 12, 16 hour days in the kitchen while we were working our other jobs. So yeah. on our two days off, we were in the kitchen cooking all day long. And uh, that lasted for about two months, man. And then yeah. we just we had some volume, right? We were selling right, right, some right. food, thankfully, right? Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and then we decided it was time to hire a chef. So, and uh, and I, and I heard in there, by the way, you're working in your other job while you're doing this too. Oh yeah. So so, so we've been in business just uh, uh, just over two years, right? Mm -hmm. We just had our two year mark, and for the whole first year year and a couple of months, I was still working full time in, in finance. And so Nick Corso kind of took over a, quite a bit of the operational stuff. Mm -hmm. He he quit his job about, about I don't know, six months before I did. And yeah. uh, so he kind of handled all that while I was still working. And then um, I went full time in February of 19. So right out, yeah. about a year I've been on. Full time that's, at That's crazy. It. Yeah, for sure. And I know you weren't just like starting out cooking too, because actually I, I partook in Dollars Prep Kitchen a lot. Uh, oh, absolutely. Amazing, by the way. Yeah. But I remember whenever I had anything customer service question-wise, getting orders, it was actually you or Nick yeah. uh, sometimes texting me back either through the Facebook Messenger or through text itself, which was pretty wild. I actually got to see things grow, so I was pretty yeah, excited about that. Yeah, you, you've been with us for a long time, you know, and so uh, you, you saw from the struggles of trying to grow the business, yeah. right, to having to build the infrastructure where... Our technology wasn't good. We have errors when you're ordering or mm -hmm. customer service issues. I mean, up until six months ago, I f literally was taking pictures of the food, posting on Instagram every yeah. single day. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. were taking customer service on um, Instagram messages, phone calls, emails. It was us, you know, and that's yeah. a part of that, you know, hustle until you can actually hire people to do the job, right? right? right. And so it took us a year and a half to really be able to hire a customer service team, right? Mm -hmm. We have... We have customer service agents that handle everything as far as phone calls, emails, order issues, or, or anything. Um, you know, I have operations manager. We have nighttime crew managers. I mean, we have, you know, 25 employees now oh. that, are, that are doing everything, you know. And so up until, like I said, six months ago, you have to do it all, you know. Yeah. So, no, that's, yeah. that's, that's really dealing with Dealing with any kind of issues or technology issue or ordering issues or anything like that, I mean, it was... It was a wear and tear kind of deal I for sure, it. but you it. had to do it. And I think, I think with good customer service is what's really kind of set us up for success, right? Yeah. People are like, this is the best customer service I've oh, ever yeah, had. Yeah. You guys resolved the issue or you answered right away or this and that. And mm -hmm. we, we still to this day make sure that customer service is the best because yeah. that's what keeps a lot of people. They're like, man, they, te they care about me if mm -hmm. I had an issue or, you know, I'm missing something or whatever yeah. it might be, you know, and quality product. And uh, good customer service, yeah. I think, is what, what's nah, really set us up. customer service was amazing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> something kind of random. I remember uh, you were given, like, it was, like, holiday season discount cards. Sure, and sure. I remember you had, like, no cap on how oh, many yeah, you yeah. didn't get. And I got a ridiculous <laughs> amount. <laughs> but, uh, but, hey, that was a big thing. I, I thought of that because I wanted to get to the next point, like, advertising, getting people in the door. You had mentioned uh, you did all the Instagram yourself. 
Um, I think your account has like over five figures, right? Followers? Yeah, we have, well, we have uh, about 25,000 followers okay. right now. And yeah. you started that from nothing two oh, years ago. So let's say someone's in the B2C business, maybe they are selling food, uh, the same type of situation or slightly different, but in general, they're looking to grow their social media where, where it can allow for a lot of pictures. What were like a few things that allowed you to leverage and get further where you got a huge follower base, um, a, a large like just social media presence and, and sure. how did you build that in two years? Um, I mean, I'm definitely not your marketing guru, right? So, <laughs> right? Uh, I just felt like real, true pictures, real engagement, real, you know, people love food, mm -hmm. right? So right. People, when no matter what you see a picture of good looking food, you're gonna like it just because it's just a natural reaction, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, that looks good, I like it, right? Yeah. It's, it's not the most exciting stuff, but you can relate to good food, right? Yeah, so yeah. You, you like seeing it. And so content was just important, but then it was just engagement, right? Mm -hmm. When someone commented, we commented back. Right. When someone messaged, we messaged back. And yeah. you know, you go follow people that are doing the same kind of thing that you're doing or that are in the same industry or fitness or you know the, the normal everyday busy person type of thing. But um, really there wasn't any rhyme or reason. I would literally post at any time of the day where you know there's so much algorithms and stuff with Instagram now and 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 it's tricky. So I knew I had to let the professionals do it to really right. to Once benefit to now. Work. Right. And so everyone also wants to take pictures of food. I don't know what it is, but you know, we, we don't ask for it and we appreciate every bit of it. But yeah. Our customers just for some reason love to take pictures yeah. of our food and post it and tag us and and I think I think that's a huge thing, right? And people talk about good quality food, yeah. you know. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, when you're taking our food to work and people are seeing it, they're you know people are like, oh, yeah. go check them out, you know. And yeah. I think that's just how we've grown it, you know. And it's just been purely organic, right? Yeah. I mean, of course, there's some paid ads and things along mm -hmm. the way, but it, it's true, true, just growth, and it it kind of justifies where we've came in two years yeah, you know yeah, yeah. i mean to be what we where we are today kind of relates to that growth on instagram right i mean um it's grown crazy and we've grown pretty damn yeah, crazy too yeah no you know? I, see, I see your story the amount of people that share on your stories is, is crazy but yeah. what's that what's that term phone eat phone eats first Phone eats first. Up oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. So now we have phone, <laughs> phone preps first. Yeah, there you phone go. <laughs> but no. I, I would have to say they play everything plates like really easily. Like sure. it looks, I mean, your food looks beautiful. I'm not gonna try to dab you up too much. There but it's pretty. Go. It's pretty amazing. Guys. We we get a lot of people who are like, that's got to be photoshopped or it's got to <laughs> be a stock photo. Oh wow. You know, but at the end of the day. It is literally a picture that's taken right here in the yeah. kitchen. You know, it's yeah. our food. We don't dress it up. It's literally that good. Mm -hmm. uh, it photos well. It looks well when it gets to you. It's, yeah, yeah. Uh, it doesn't change its look, right? I right, mean, right. There are definitely meal prep services out there that definitely have glorified pictures. I mean, I've ate them all. We've we've yeah. ordered every single meal prep business in the last two years. Oh, ordered wow. their food in to test, right? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. it's frozen. They say it's not frozen. It comes. All half frozen they're hoping it thaws out to you by the time oh, it gets yeah. to you think i mean it's things like that right i mean yeah, yeah. and you can tell their photo looks nothing like the meal that's in front of you and we want to make sure that we have great content and the food looks good mm -hmm. but it looks the same when it gets to your house right yeah, i mean because yeah. we don't freeze it it doesn't change freshness or color or anything like that and so well, it's same day delivery yeah saying, absolutely right? yeah. so uh, i mean it helps that we don't freeze the food yeah. and, it, and it's fresh and and uh we, we don't do anything that's going to really change the structure of that food, though, either, right? right? right. I mean, it's pretty basic whole food items, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you start getting more creative with the meals, that food isn't going to stay fresh as, well, as mm -hmm. long because you're mixing multiple things together, right? right? right. So we kind of have an advantage on that part, yeah. for sure. Now, you did say that there's a lot of feedback and you're going a lot into the pre-made meals instead of the bulk prep. What's... What's the biggest challenge you found for that? Maybe maybe this, what you just said, where it's, where it's yeah, a complexity. So, so the freshness, definitely, you can tell that a bulk container our food, right? So anybody that doesn't know us, we do bulk, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you do get a pound of chicken and a pound of turkey and a couple items, right? And then uh, that food's going to stay longer, better longer, right? right, right. Than if you're going to mix a meal together because there's multiple things touching and things that can change its mm. chemical, whatever. But... 
that's probably one of the biggest things is is the freshness and keeping it longer lasting longer but right. definitely going to be more of the the margins right you want to give someone this amazing meal but again we're meal prep you can't charge someone thirty dollars for a fillet right yeah but but you want to sell them fillet but the margins aren't there right, right? right so you have to think about what foods are going to still be desired but have some margin there right yeah, yeah. Um, at the end of the day we're here to make money and there's got to be some margin but yeah of course um but uh so that that's the big thing but then we really want to have a kind of a revolving menu and not just the same thing all the time, right? We don't want people to get bored. We want them to know or think what's coming next, what's next yeah, yeah. week or what's next month. So we're trying to be innovative more than what we have been because it's really yeah. been just a set menu, right? Yeah. And so creating new meals, it takes two to three weeks to put the nutrition facts together. It takes time for labels, like all that, right? Mm -hmm. And so people think, oh, you can just throw a meal together and it takes, it, there's a lot of back work to yeah, it. Right? Yeah, of so, course. yeah, of course. Um, the question of curiosity. Sure. So you are actually figuring out the nutrition pieces of each uh, either um, either bulk prep that you're selling or meal. How do, like is it like a lab test? How that I have no idea how that sure. works. How does that work? Yeah, so we we have nutrition facts on every single item that we give you, and every one of them has been tested, right? So. Okay. Uh, we want you to know exactly what you're eating. Mm -hmm. um, we don't tell you all the ingredients because we don't want someone to take our sweet potato recipe or something. Yeah, yeah, right? but, yeah, yeah. But you definitely know the macros from fat, protein, carbs, uh, sugar, sodium, mm -hmm. all that good stuff. Um, obviously, the chef puts together a recipe. We tweak it. We find out what's going to work best, and then we go put the nutrition facts together. And if it's too high in fat, then we figure out how we can mm -hmm. lower that. Or yeah. then, we, then we have the final recipe and it gets sent off as well, and they, they create the nutritional facts and make sure everything's perfect. A, so. lot, of fee a lot of feedback. Oh, yeah. I feel sure. like feedback has been, I, I don't, we didn't really talk about this, but it seems to me from when I saw this, this whole DPK, like, start where it is now, like, there's been so many changes, like, small changes, like, even the bags oh, yeah. or, like, the times that you could order, making more partnerships with the different gyms that you can sure. order from. Um, so how... Are there things that you just like refuse to change or like how willing are you to change things and and how how much lag the size of the company right now how much lag time is there when you need to change something to, uh, from when you decide to change something to when it's fully implemented yeah I mean it we try to move as quick as possible but there's definitely you know a month of really analyzing something is this how we want to do it you know mm -hmm. we want to make sure we think about the good and the bad result of mm -hmm. that change uh, so I mean there's weeks month couple months on some things right yeah, yeah. so you know the bag thing we used to have just the good old little shopper plastic yeah. clear bags yeah, right and you break some handles if we filled it up with too many or too many items and the food wasn't wouldn't stay cold because it wasn't refri it wasn't right, a right. cooler right so the, well we originally started with paper bags right like oh. paper shoppers oh, I remember that yeah and say you get a little steak juice out of a container or something you know the bag would rip or whatnot right. and then we decided oh the plastic ones would be better and then the handles would rip sometimes and again they weren't cooled um, and when you're delivering to 40 some locations across mm -hmm. Dallas you know you got to keep the food cold and we those are growing pains right like mm -hmm. we we're not thinking all oh, the food sitting in a car for an hour and a half right, or right. something but it would still be okay, but it's just better to be on the safe side, right? right so right. now we invest in these shopper bags. We don't charge the customer for it. Uh, it's a huge expense to us, but it's quality, mm -hmm. right? Like we want to make sure the food's good, it's safe to you. Uh, customers love these bags type of things. But those bags took two months for production because we print our labels on them. Right, we, right. we buy so many at a time for a discount price, or, you know, things like that. Some things we're never going to change is definitely the quality of the food, right? Right, right, right. Uh, never going to freeze our food. I don't care if it would save me on shipping or last longer for the customer. You know, we're not going to ever freeze it because that mm -hmm. definitely changes the structure of that food, right, the right. quality of it, the flavor, all that. Um, we're always going to stay healthy as far as never using any kind of creams or butters or, you know, anything outside of the health. I, mm -hmm. I don't want this to be boring food, and it's definitely not. There's ways to make food flavorful and mm. taste good and healthy without, you know, jeopardizing yeah. the nutritional facts of yeah, it, yeah. right? And so things like that we're never going to never gonna change. Um, we're definitely 
we listen to our consumers for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, when someone says you guys should do this, we analyze it and we say, is that something that's actually going to benefit our customers? Right, are we right. going to be able to make that happen? Is it going to, yeah. you know, what are the good and the bad, you know? And we've implemented a lot of new things because customers have asked for certain things, right? right. So adding new, new bulk items to the menu. Now we have over 55 actual items you can buy in a pound or pound and a half option, this is crazy. which is unreal. We That's started so with crazy. like 20 and now we're up to 50. We don't want you to go to the grocery store. <laughs> yeah. I want you to buy everything from our menu. There's no need to go to a grocery store. Uh, to kind of go off of that, we're launching sauces here in like two weeks. So, oh, cool. you know, barbecue sauce, Caesar dressing, all homemade salsa, ranch? like ranch, oh, hell uh, yeah. Greek yogurt ranch, uh, just there's a ton of honey mustard. Everything's gonna be made in house from scratch. I know preservatives, super healthy dressings, right? Nice. But that just you don't need to go to the grocery store. Yeah, anymore. you got you everything. Got Dallas Prep Kitchen, but uh, <laughs> that's yeah. a, that, that's a tagline right there. Yeah. You do not need to go to the grocery <laughs> store anymore. You have Dallas Prep Kitchen. Yeah, that's right. I feel like we can like make that a little bit better, <laughs> but you got, I think you got little jingle good. there. Yeah, little sure. jingle. Um, so. I think I could already guess this just kind of hearing what you're saying about um, quality and feedback, Luke. But if you were to kind of nail down like one overriding reason that DPK has gone from where it is to where it is now and further, what would that be? I mean, I think the thing that sets us apart is the flavor and the quality of the food, for yeah. sure. Like I said, we've ate every single meal prep service that's out there. The local people, you know, the, the ones across you know, on the coast that, you know, we've shipped in every, pretty much any competitor that we feel and right, we've right. tried food and I don't feel like anything stands up to our food. And yeah. that, it really goes back to the freshness, never frozen, you know, how we prepare it. It's not, it is mass produced cause we're, we're at that volume. Yeah. But if you continue, we have 18 cooks in here on a cook mm -hmm. day, making sure that, you know, one cook only cooks three or four items and mm -hmm. puts every, all soul and heart into that love into that piece of yeah, yeah. food right and so we want to make sure that that continues and and that's what's made us grow for sure yeah, i mean the quality yeah absolutely and customer service i think we have yeah. some top-notch customer service yeah i do hear because uh, across other industries i hear customer service all has to be number one but when you're f the full the full customer experience is the taste sure. really i mean we're right. a food business right I yeah mean, there's so many other options out there to have meal prep, right? I mean, right. And, and so your food has to stand out, and right, then right. I, customer service has to be equal. But you got to get the people to love your food first. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, absolutely. For sure. um, so I know you're saying getting all this done. There's been so much change. You have this uh, uh, much larger location. I want to talk about that in a second. But uh, but all this stuff is happening. There's so much change before you were working a job and doing this. Um, you and Nick were, were doing the cooking yourself. You're barely sleeping, getting all this done. Now, even though you have help, you still have so much going on and so much change. Like what I've realized, at least for myself, a lot of um, being a business owner is mental. Uh, what, what would you say is some of the things that kind of help you internally to keep yourself disciplined, keep yourself in the right mind space so they're not wigging out? Sure. Um, I mean, I golf as much as I possibly can. <laughs> now, that that's kind of my uh, my um, zen. Yeah, yeah, a place that I can take a couple hours and, and kind of I still think business while I'm out there, but right. I uh, I get a kind of set back and, and enjoy that. But uh, no, really, it's it's just thinking about the future, about you know we're I'm always thinking three to six months ahead. How how can we do something different? How can we be innovative or mm -hmm. how can we, you know, grow what else, what other stream of revenue, you know, from catering or, or this or that. Right. And yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I mean, thinking about like the daily operations, it's an oiled machine. This thing runs, I don't even have to come to the kitchen if I don't want to where six months ago, we were in the kitchen every single cook day right. from start to finish, just making sure that everything was going well. Now we have operation manager that takes care of everything. Our mm -hmm. chef has the, the crew handled all that. Right. So right. I don't have to worry at all on a cook day if we're cooking something correct or if things are getting packaged right or whatever mm -hmm. that is completely handled so that alone takes a lot of stress off of me right and so yeah. just to be able to think growth and and what can we do on that that's more exciting to me because you know like the sales part of it or the 
the entrepreneur wants to grow their business and not right. worry about the daily operations, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'd say mental set has definitely gotten much clearer and uh, less stressful for sure just because of the growth, right? So, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, that's... So you keep yourself itself. excited about yeah. the future and you, as quickly as possible, fix the holes so that oh, it could be well, well yeah, yeah. And a little bit of golf. A little golf. A little golf. Especially when KC's down 21-0. Oh, God. <laughs> Thank God we won. I was a big uh, Kansas City fan. I recall some Facebook statuses <laughs> where he had... <laughs> I was all by myself watching the game, so I just decided I would talk to people on Facebook. You know? <laughs> Every few minutes, I was putting another post up, and I almost left to go play golf. Yeah, uh, so uh, close. Good. What a great good, comeback, good though. Man, you, so yeah. I'm glad I didn't go golf. But. Yeah. Well, I'm sure everyone in Dallas was happy about that outcome. Houston, not so much. Yeah. <laughs> but it is, it is what it is. Um, Cool, man. So, uh, question question still about that because I was thinking like you you got it to this point where it's well oiled, but like has there ever been in the, these two and a half years has there been a moment where you not that you wanted to give up, but you're like, oh shit, is this gonna be the end? Like, did I fuck up this bad, or or this shit's going so terribly that like I don't know what to do. I mean, I, I think we all get to that point where you're kind of in like a dark place or some at some point at least have a situation that you're like, I don't know how to get out of this or have you had that? And how did you push yourself through that? Oh, yeah. We, I mean, we've had tons of setbacks, you know, I mean, we when we were first starting, you know, we would we paid a paid a guy to do some marketing stuff and it cost us four grand. And a couple of days later, we, you know, we ended up going a different route, you oh, know, shit. Uh, I mean, there was things at one of our kitchens we were cooking out of, uh, we had outgrown, but uh, there was a huge storm that came through Dallas and the power went out and it was gone for three days, mm -hmm. you know? So yeah. we had to get a reefer truck and we had to, you know, put all of our all of our food in a, on a truck and mm -hmm. we couldn't cook for three days. So we had customers upset that no food, you know? And yeah. I mean, that was a huge setback. Thank God no financial setback really, except um, maybe a few lost customers that hopefully yeah, yeah. we got back once we got going again. But, um, you know, financial stuff, we, we bootstrapped this. It, we don't, we didn't raise a million dollars. We didn't, yeah, yeah, yeah. we didn't go out and get funding. We, we totally bootstrapped it. And so when you make a bad financial decision or the money's not coming in cause your margins weren't right or something mm -hmm. like that. Right. I mean, that's definitely been some setbacks, but we, we have it down now to where, you know, we, we've got the business side of it figured out. We're growing. We, we still don't have, we haven't raised money, you know, we're still bootstrapped it to this point. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, um, there's a lot, there's been plenty of setbacks as a young, yeah. you know, this is our first business we ever, we've ever owned, right. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, to be at this point, you know, you were going to go through some setbacks, yeah, right. So sure. it just comes with it. But and I think, I think we're better now because we went through those, you know, when we do a contract with somebody or a vendor or something, we go through it and make sure that we have either an out of it or, or we analyze it over a month instead mm -hmm. of making impulsive decisions and things yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. you know, so. And what are you telling yourself in your head during those times to keep yourself going? Uh, that we're growing 20, 25% quarter after quarter, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah. we're growing for a reason. This is that we don't have 2,300 five-star reviews for yeah, no yeah. reason, right? right, we, right we've right. created a business that people enjoy and love the food. We just have to keep making it work, right? So you just you, focus on the good. Oh, absolutely. That's what's up. Yeah, you got to. So you got to focus on the good. Yeah, there's no, you can't, you can't dwell over you can't the bad, dwell. right? Like that's you can't true. do anything that's already been done. And yeah. the only thing that's going to keep you going is thinking about what this business is going to be in three or four years, you right, know? Right. If we can be here already, what's it going to be if we continue to improvise, you know, be innovative and do new things. And, mm -hmm. you know, we hired, hired and brought on a, He's a partner now, Joe Shaw, he's our nutritionist, mm -hmm. you know? And so now we offer our clients nutritional help. So if mm -hmm. you don't know what you're doing and, and you need help or you just want structure and accountability, well, we've got that guy, right? right? right. And he's also our technology guy. So our, our website is, is much better than it ever was, yeah, right? Yeah. So you go through those heartaches and the struggles of a bad website or it's ordering issues. And, you know, now it's seamless, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and just the things that we've started doing, if, mm -hmm we can do if we can bring in these new new things and and mm -hmm. new marketing and new new technology and whatnot and 
and see the growth that we're seeing, I mean, who knows what the future is going to bring, yeah, right? I know. For sure. Speaking of the future, uh, last thing I want to talk about is you do have a new big kitchen coming. Yeah. Uh, so what's, what does that hold in store for DPK? Well, it's definitely going to allow us to, to do much more volume, right? Mm -hmm. We're pretty restricted here as far as how many people we can fit in here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we are, we're building a 10,000 square foot kitchen up in Addison. It's pretty exciting right mm -hmm. now. Um, we literally just uh, did the did the deal oh, about a month ago. So we're still a few months mm -hmm. out from it being ready, but um, it's gonna allow us to really operate at a much higher volume. Right. Um, you know, it's got an entire plating room that's a refrigerator basically. So food safely refrigerated, where right now we cram into a little walk-in mm -hmm. cooler you yeah, know, to yeah, plate yeah. food. So that doesn't work very well, but it has to be done. So just being more efficient, quicker, you know, being able to do higher volume and things like that. It's oh, you know, pretty actually. exciting stuff for sure. And I know you had kind of mentioned that through this bigger endeavor, you're starting to see that there might be a change in kind of the restaurant industry in general, kind of, you said ghost kitchens? Yeah, so so that that's kind of another another business, right? But it's a new thing. And so we decided if we were gonna build a kitchen for ourselves, mm -hmm. Uh, the new thing in the food industry is what's called ghost kitchens. Mm -hmm. And these are basically where restaurants, they have their brick and mortar locations, but now with Uber Eats and DoorDash and Favor mm -hmm. and all that, a lot of their business, you know, anywhere from 20 to 40% of their business is now mm -hmm. becoming online, on demand kind of orders. And so they need places to cook. And yeah. so we're building a, a commercial rental kitchen basically is what it is. We'll cook out of it. It'll have our own space and then it mm -hmm. has different pods for these kitchens or these restaurants to come in and use our space. Mm -hmm. So now they have a centralized location in Addison where they can have a couple guys in there. They don't have to pay anything but rent, right? They just got two workers. They're putting out, you know, hundreds of orders a day if they could, you know, if the mm -hmm. volume's there. And, uh, and so now they get a focus. That's another stream of revenue for those restaurants where uh, they they might not have been able to do that kind of volume because right, right. they were limited by their restaurant space, right? right, or right. A big thing is like a mom and pop uh, restaurant, right? Just maybe they have one restaurant and it's a small one and they can fit maybe, you know, 40 people sit down or something, mm -hmm. right? But their kitchen is so small. Well, what if you really love their food and you want them to cater your wedding or something mm. and they can't do that right. because they don't have the space. Well, now they can rent our space for a Saturday, cook mm. this big you know, wedding parties, right, right, food, right. and and that alone helps those mom and pop restaurants because that's a huge stream of income that they would have had to have mm -hmm. declined, but oh. now they get to accept and it's going to yeah. help them financially as well. So, there, there's a the ghost kitchen is its is its own thing. It's a huge deal that's happening across the country, and we hope to hope to expand into other cities rather quickly with that as yeah. well. Um, and uh, but the, the caterers and the small time, the meal, meal prep guys, mm -hmm. you know, there's bakers, there's people that are doing it on an even smaller level. They need kitchens to cook out of. And so it's going to really benefit yeah. a lot of people and, and really help the food industry here in Dallas for sure. So you, do you think, uh, well, first off, do you think that's kind of making it so the little guys can kind of come up and compete with the bigger guys a oh, little absolutely. bit more? absolutely. I mean, you have to start somewhere. And there's no way a, a startup or a small guy can afford a $100,000 build-out kitchen like this or right. something, right? I mean, you have, to, you have to be able to rent space. And even some of the guys that have all the money in the world, they don't want to build their own kitchen. Right, right. They want to just go rent, a, rent some space, right? Yeah, yeah. So... I mean, it, you have all the all the equipment there, all the pots and pans, smallware, all the the infrastructure. The you know we're gonna have it to where you can cook your food and Uber Eat drivers come into a certain area and all your food will be expoed out of there. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have people there that are helping with the expo of the food. You don't have to even touch the drivers or deal right, with right. them, right? So yeah, yeah. it's just a very much um, efficient process for that. But yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, we know some people in the you know, starting meal prep, or there's someone I know that does baking here in Dallas, and they they really can't get going because they don't have a space to cook out of, right? And you can't right. cook out of your house anymore. That's completely, you know, bad practice and illegal, anyways. Yeah. You know, and so but <laughs> yeah. pe people have to do it because they can't afford a rental sp or their own space. So uh, we see a huge demand for it. Um, we already have a ton of inquiries and, mm -hmm. and people already on contract for it and oh, we right. haven't even started 
really opening. That's what's right? up. Yeah, so pretty excited for that for sure. Uh, and out of curiosity too, because this stuff is the ghost kitchen is really interesting because uh, we see, like you said, DoorDash, Grubhub, all of that's happening now. People don't even want to go out so much really sure. anymore. Do you think it will get so big where we'll start to see a huge dip in like fast food? I don't think fast food because those those guys can produce that food right out of their store still, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you're, I believe brick and mortar restaurants are going to see a change over the next five to 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. they, they're having a hard time filling the front of the house because people don't go out and eat as often. Mm -hmm. Now there's still gonna be people go out, but mm -hmm. Tuesday night isn't as busy as Tuesday night used to be, right, right? Right, right? Saturday and Sunday, Friday nights, of course, but you know, midweek, restaurants are having a hard time. So they're really relying on these on-demand stuff. So a lot of them are going to bring in that extra revenue and really focus on the on-demand um, okay. orders bec just because there's no overhead, there's there's none of all that, right? right? right. You don't have to have a, a 4,000 square foot restaurant anymore. You right, know, right. You, you're literally a ghost kitchen. Yeah, you yeah. Know? So, so it's kind of like that mid-level restaurant is going to start maybe to decline in five, ten years. Yeah, I think so. From brick and mortar spots. I think yeah. I think a lot of them are. There's there's restaurant owners that are literally n creating uh, ghost restaurants, basically, oh, wow. right? To where yeah, they yeah. just create a menu, they launch it on Uber Eats, they cook it out of our kitchen. Mm -hmm. right and then they just sell off it's basically an online restaurant they mm -hmm. don't even have a brick and mortar store for this restaurant and mm -hmm. so that's that's the new thing you can have the same you can make five restaurant concepts out of the same kitchen and oh, just wow. put them all online right now yeah, yeah. you know you've got billy's barbecue and billy's burgers and billy's pizza and mm -hmm. it's all out of the same kitchen yeah. and you, you didn't have to build a brick and mortar for right, it right, right? Right, right i mean food trucks are a big thing and it's kind of the same thing a food truck can now have a centralized kitchen mm. they can come cook out of our kitchen throw on uber eats and do the same thing that they were doing out of their truck oh, that's right awesome but get to a bigger broader audience because now they're on uber eats or doordash gotcha. or whatever so not only are you going to be bringing amazing prep food and meals but now you're actually able to help smaller guys grow as well sure so one two punch <laughs> doing my thing doing your thing <laughs> doing, uh, what, doing what we can do i mean it's obviously uh uh, it's it's going to be a great business as well. It's a, yeah. a great model, but it really is going to help people. It, we wouldn't be where we are today if we didn't have a rental kitchen, right? right and so right, right. we've went through four rental kitchens because we've outgrown every single one of them. Yeah. And now finally we have our own right here, but this we already outgrown this one. So yeah, yeah. we needed a much larger kitchen and we just thought while we're doing it, yeah. why not get a bigger one and help, sure. help and the help other others. people out. <laughs> Give back to the community. Yeah. All right, I got one more thing for you. You said back when you were 15, you were, you were flipping Domino's pizzas. <laughs> if, you could, if, if Kyle, 35-year-old Kyle, could tell 15-year-old Kyle right now uh, something uh, to get himself mm. jump-started to where you are now or to what you are or anything that he did that you're like, eh, you probably should lay off of that, what would advice you would give to a 15-year-old Kyle right now? Man, that's tough. Um, the entrepreneur life is tough, right? But it's rewarding at the same time. You're yeah. doing something and you're building something where, where instead of working for somebody, I'll probably never, hopefully, ever have to work for somebody again, yeah. right? And, and at 15, of course, you're not really worried about that. But I would, I would, talk, I would think about learning, learning business in a way, right? Learn, right? learn entrepreneurial skills and what it takes to run a business because Really, there's so many opportunities out there. I mean, we I've created, you know, three or four real businesses that are now starting up, and I never had that experience or really that kind of mindset, mm -hmm. you know, 10 years ago even. Mm -hmm. So uh, I wish I would have started when I was 20 years old and, yeah, yeah. and doing my own thing. Because, you and me both. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, I had a great career in finance, and I that that was an amazing, amazing eight years of my life, but there's nothing more rewarding than building a, a successful business mm -hmm. that you can truly see the growth five, 10 years down the road and what's going to, what it's really going to be. You yeah. Know? So yeah, for sure. Just hustle. And, and, uh, you know, if you can, you know, be, be your own boss and be your own boss. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's what's up. 
All right, well, oh, well, man, uh, thank you so much. Uh, once again, I'm, I'm going to conclude this. Uh, I'm Roger Dupre from Eastwood Energy. This is Kyle Clark, uh, CEO and founder of Dallas Prep Kitchen. Looking for the future, man. Uh, thanks for tuning in, guys. I hope that was helpful. Uh, and if you're looking for a space to rent for a rental kitchen up in Addison, give this guy a call. I'll put his uh, number up above. And uh, once again, man, thanks for coming Absolutely. out. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And uh, we'll see you guys later. Thanks for tuning in. Tuning in? Uh. <laughs>